word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening, church. Nice to see you. My name is Paul. If I haven't met you, I'm one of the pastors. Uh, before I preach tonight, I just want to thank uh, Johnny. Where's Johnny? Uh, you've just been such a great encouragement to me personally. Thanks for the way you've served so humbly. We're going to miss you. We're excited by what the Lord had in store for you. Uh, and it's sad to see Marcus and Chelsea go, but they're going to Neutral Bay, and I'm there most weeks anyway. So <laughs> I still get to see you, which is a great joy. Um, I've loved preparing John 16. I've loved preparing. So I'm going to pray that the Spirit might uh, use me uh, to speak his word powerfully tonight. Our Father, I want to thank you for this precious word that you've left with us. You promised that your word would not return empty, and so we pray expectantly for your Spirit to do a powerful work in us tonight. Father, we don't want to leave unchanged, so please change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one of my heroes of the faith is a lady called Cory Ten Boom, and she said this about the work of the Holy Spirit. She said, trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. And that is so true. And without the Holy Spirit, doing the Lord's work is exhausting. Without the Holy Spirit, trying to live the Christian life is utterly exhausting. But with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus just flows out of you. A Spurgeon says the same thing, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without wind, we're like branches without sap, we're like coals without fire, we are useless. Church, do you believe that? Do you believe without the Holy Spirit at work in your life, you can do nothing? Now, I need the Holy Spirit, you need the Holy Spirit, we all need the Holy Spirit. And that's why I've loved grappling with John 16. It's a great chapter about the Holy Spirit. And I've been pondering some of the, the comments that people sometimes make about our church. Uh, some people say that we are too charismatic. And some people say we're too conservative. Some people say we're all spirit and, and no word. And some people say we're all word and no spirit. You can't please anybody, can you? But from my reading of the scriptures, when I first became a Christian, I didn't see this separation between word and spirit. It's the word and the spirit working together, isn't it? Now, without the Holy Spirit, there is no word of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot understand the word of God. Without the Holy Spirit, there are no believers. We cannot understand who Jesus is. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot grow in your faith. And if the word is preached powerfully and lives are being transformed according to the scriptures, that is a spirit-filled church, isn't it? Augustine said, without the spirit, we can neither love God nor keep his commands. And maybe, just maybe, you're here tonight and you're desperately trying to love God and keep his commands in your strength without the Holy Spirit. And that is exhausting. So in John 16, this wonderful chapter about the Holy Spirit... And Jesus says something very strange in verse 7. Look at it with me. 16 verse 7. He says to his disciples, Very truly I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. And they're thinking, what Jesus? Really? I'd really rather you stayed with us. How can it be for our good that you're leaving us? How can it be for our good that we're going to do life without you, Jesus? Keep reading, verse 7. Unless I go away, says Jesus, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus is saying, unless I go, the advocate will not come. And the advocate is the Holy Spirit. He's not just a counselor, not just a comforter. He's called the advocate. That word, remember, it means the one who comes alongside. The one who comes alongside you to care, to protect, to intercede, to help you. He's the helper because we all need all the help we can possibly get. He, the Holy Spirit, he's a person, not a force. He, not an it. So when the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us, 
That is God's presence with us, God's power in us, God's peace for us. So I want to unpack five extraordinary truths about the Holy Spirit tonight that will, unpack, that will, that will transform your Christian life. Here's the first one. The Holy Spirit illuminates Jesus. That's his job. His job is to shine the spotlight onto Jesus, to, to magnify Jesus, to testify about Jesus. 15 verse 26, when the advocate comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. There's a great Trinitarian verse. The spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, here it is, he will testify, he will speak about me, says Jesus. That's his job, to make Jesus big. He says the same thing down in 16, verse 14. He, the spirit, will glorify me, Jesus. So that's the spirit's job, to to magnify, to glorify, to shine the spotlight onto the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So church, you've got to believe this. The Spirit did not come to, to, to take center stage in the church. The Spirit wants the Lord Jesus Christ to take center stage. And I've said this before, it's a bit like there's a spotlight at a theater. The, the job of the spotlight is to shine light onto the stage so the people can see the main actor. And so when you go to the theatre, please don't spend your entire time staring at the spotlight. Because you missed the main game. Same with the Holy Spirit. You're not supposed to look endlessly at the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to look endlessly at the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's the Spirit's job, to magnify him, to bring the glory to Christ. Jim Packer says, the Spirit's message is never, look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me. The Spirit's message is look at Jesus and see the glory of Jesus. Listen to Jesus, hear Jesus' words, go to Jesus and find life in him. This is really important. So The Spirit is not hurt. He doesn't feel neglected if he's not mentioned in every song and every prayer as long as Jesus Christ is mentioned. So when people say to me, Paul, your church is lacking the Spirit, I want to say, is that because we don't talk about Jesus enough? Because the greatest sign that the Spirit of God is at work in any church is that the Lord Jesus Christ is lifted high. And the greatest sign the Spirit of God is at work in your life and my life is that you're seeking to live a life that honors and magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ. So he illuminates. Number two, he convicts. The Holy Spirit convicts the world. That's his job, to convince, to persuade unbelievers that they are lost without Christ. Keep reading, 16 verse 8. When he, the Spirit, comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. That that, that phrase, prove to be in the wrong, it means to convince, to expose, to persuade, to clear the mist away from our eyes. And so the, so the Spirit is not just like a, a spotlight in a theater. The Spirit is like one of those, those helicopter floodlights. Have you ever seen a police helicopter fly over a suburb as they're seeking out someone who's done the wrong thing late at night? And that floodlight, it exposes the entire suburb. It exposes the evil. It exposes the darkness and brings hope and life to those living in fear. That's the Holy Spirit exposing guilt, exposing shame in a world living without Jesus. He, he convinces people that they are lost without him. He helps people to confess that they're a sinner in need of a saviour. That's what Jesus did when he walked on earth, isn't it? Remember when Jesus met the Samaritan woman? Within minutes, she's saying, oh, you know, I messed up, I need, need a saviour. And what Jesus did on earth, the Spirit continues to do because he is the Spirit of Jesus. We're told in verse 9 that he convicts the world of sin because people don't believe in Jesus. Notice verse 9, it's not sins, it's sin. The sins are the, the lying and the greed and the nasty words and the selfishness, the outworking of sin. But sin is that heart attitude of not believing in Jesus. Sin is saying, there is no God, I'll live my life my way, thank you very much. That is sin. And the, word la- the world laughs at sin. 
But I watch it happen. I watch the Spirit almost switch the lights on and people start to realize that they are not perfect. They're not good. And they need Jesus. That's the Spirit's work. Now, I've said it before. I need to say it again. It's the, it's the Spirit's job to convict people of their sin. It's not your job and my job. Because when most Christians try and convince other people that they are sinners, it just comes across as judgment or condemnation. But the Spirit's very good at it. When when you sit under the Word of God, He cuts people to the core. Remember Pentecost? On one day, the Spirit came and 3,000 people were cut to the core shouting, what must I do to be saved? Let the Spirit do His work of convicting of sin. Not just sin, verse 10, he convicts of righteousness. Because Jesus says, I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. So the Spirit doesn't just shine a spotlight into our hearts exposing sin. He shines a spotlight onto Jesus, the righteous one. And he helps us to see that only Jesus is the righteous one. Only Jesus is blameless and without blemish and perfect and holy. Only Jesus is the righteous Son of God. And when you spot that, But when you see Jesus as the perfect, righteous Son of God, it's like a mirror to your own soul because you realize you're not as good as you thought you were. When I was a brand new believer 30 years ago, I thought I was pretty good at playing the game of squash. Remember that game with a racket and a ball? I think it's going to make a comeback. Uh, and I arrogantly talked to my new pastor at my church in Debs and Oxford. I said, oh, do you want to get him a squash? I'm pretty good at squash. And this pastor, his name was Vaughan. He said, sure, I'll play squash with you. We played four games. First set was 11 nil. The second set was 11 nil. Third, 11 nil. Fourth, 11 nil. And I'm thinking, like, how could a pastor thrash a new believer like this? But, <laughs> but more than that, it was kind of humbling. I was like, I thought I was pretty good, but actually I'm pretty average. And when you see Jesus as a righteous one, the Spirit just shows you you're not quite as good as you thought you were. Do you grasp that? He convicts all about sin and righteousness and judgment. Verse 11, about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So the Spirit opens your eyes to a day called Judgment Day when every single one of us will stand before our Maker and give an account. And He opens our eyes to the deceptions of the prince of this world, of the devil, who tries to trick people that there is no such thing as judgment. So just eat, drink, and be merry. This is an extraordinary work of the Spirit. And this is why it is so much better that Jesus left. Because how could Jesus convict people in Australia and Africa and Asia and America all at the same time that they are sinners who need a savior? He, he couldn't do it. He's one man in one place. But the Spirit can. The Spirit does. And as a pastor, I, I love watching the Spirit convict people. It's a beautiful work. You know, When you're leading an Alpha course or Christianity Explored course and you've got people on the table and... They're hearing the gospel and they're hearing about Jesus. And and for some people, it's like they've got a hard heart and they're saying, oh yeah, whatever, makes no sense. But for other people, the lights are going on and the spirits at work convicting them and they give their life to Christ. Praise God, that's his work, not yours. And what I find really exciting is that you can never predict who the spirit is going to convict, yes? I think of a man who walked into St. Augustine's church four and a bit years ago. At 8 a.m., he was broken, hit rock bottom, addicted to so many things. And I watched as week after week, the Spirit was at work in his life, opening his eyes to who Jesus was, and he gave his life to Christ, and now he's leading on Alpha. Praise God for that. I think of another lady who was kind of a reluctant convert. She, She had all these intellectual arguments why Jesus wasn't real or wasn't really God. And bit by bit, the Spirit of God just broke down this argument and convinced her and persuaded her that Jesus was the Son of God and she's given her life to Christ. It's really exciting. And if you're here tonight as a believer, 
believing that you are a sinner and Jesus is the righteous one, that's the Spirit's work in your life. It wasn't your work, it was his work. The Spirit illuminates, he convicts, he empowers. He empowers every believer to testify. That's the word used in 15 verse 27. He's talking to the disciples and says, you also must testify. The Spirit testifies about me, verse 26, but it's your job now to testify about Jesus. Uh, that word testify, it means to, to give evidence, to affirm, to attest, to speak about, to use words to talk about Jesus, to use your words to talk about sin and righteousness and judgment and then to let the Spirit convict. Have you heard that the slogans like, the gospel is caught and not taught? You kind of go, well, yes and no. Or, you know, win people without words. It sounds wonderful. And if you're living such a godly life that people are asking for the reason, that is wonderful. But at some point, you've got to use your words. At some point, you need to actually talk about Jesus and speak about Jesus and testify about Jesus. Otherwise, how can people be saved? But you can only testify because of the power of the Spirit in your life. It's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you will be my witnesses, same word, you will be my testifiers from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Have you ever thought about why we're sitting here in a building in Australia in 2021? Why are we here? It's because some incredible women and men loved Jesus enough to speak about Jesus. And they testified about Jesus, and they came to Australia, and they testified about Jesus, and the Spirit convicted people to believe in Jesus. And those same new believers, they testified about Jesus, and they convicted other people, and the other people testified down the generation until we're sitting here in 2021. You are only here because somebody testified about the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit. So we must testify, we must speak about Jesus do you remember Paul before Governor Felix in Acts 26? He testified. Now, now, now Paul did not say, Paul didn't say, Felix, I just want you to know that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, he may have said that, but he went on to talk about Jesus. He went on to talk about sin and righteousness and judgment. And I know that is scary, church. I know it can be really confronting, but you have to believe when you open your mouth to testify that the Spirit of God will empower you. Now, I'm not a natural evangelist. Now, I find it really easy to talk about church, and I find it easy to talk about you know, good things like you know, going down to social housing commissions, and we, we do great works with the aged care, and we have great kids and youth programs, because people like hearing about that. But when they say, oh, well, what do you really believe? Well, then I kind of get sweaty palms and I go, oh, what am I going to say here? Quick arrow prayer. And trust me, the Spirit of God empowers you. And you might say, oh, but Paul, I'm not the most eloquent person. No, but the Spirit will empower you. I mean, think about Peter. Peter said the most stupid things when Jesus was on earth, didn't he? And he couldn't even testify to a slave girl because he was so scared. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came, who is preaching to the crowds? It is Peter. And 3,000 people gave their life to Christ. What happened? Not, not what happened, who happened? The Holy Spirit happened. The Holy Spirit came on him and in him. He filled him. He empowered him. And the Spirit of God gave Peter the words to say and the courage to say it. Because people don't like hearing about Jesus and sin and righteousness and judgment. That's why Jesus warned his disciples, 16 verse 1, All this I've told you so that you will not fall away. So you won't be shaken, you won't freak out, you won't run away, you won't be taken by surprise. They'll put you out of the synagogue, they will ostracize you, cut you off in society. In fact, verse 2, the time is coming when anyone who kills you we think they're offering a service to God. Like Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, who, who really thought he was serving God by killing the Christians. Verse 3, they will do such things because they haven't known the Father or me. They don't really believe. 
Verse 4, I, I've told you this. I've warned you about persecution and suffering so that when the time comes, you remember that I warned you about them. Isn't that kind of Jesus to forewarn us? Friends, when we testify in the power of the Spirit, we might still suffer. I mean, church history has proved that, hasn't it? I mean, let's think about Jesus' closest friends. Peter was crucified upside down for testifying. James was beheaded. John was thrown into boiling oil and then exiled to the island of Patmos. Matthew was slain by a sword in Ethiopia. James, son of Alphaeus, was thrown from the top of a temple. Bartholomew was flogged to death. Andrew was bound to a cross and burned. And Thomas, who took the gospel to India, was, was killed by a spear. What on earth? What on earth? prompted these people to keep on testifying. <laughs> and the answer is the Holy Spirit. Same with the early church, the early Christians, they were thrown to the lions, they were burnt at the stake, they were placed on wooden poles, covered in tar and lit like torches. And they, they suffered the most gruesome deaths. Why did they keep on testifying? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now church, I have to say this. We have it so easy, don't we? We really do. <laughs> What's the worst that someone might do to us if we testify about Jesus? They might mock us. They might laugh at us. They might ignore us, but that's about it. So why don't we testify? Is it fear? Is it apathy? Or is it perhaps that we're just lacking that, that spiritual fire? We're stopping from the Spirit from empowering us. I watched a man this week. I was... So proud. His name is Gordon Menzies. He's part of our church. And I watched him testify to Jesus on YouTube. He entered this debate with this, this streamer called Destiny, who has millions of followers, and debating the claims of Christ. And, and Gordon, he, he, he testified to Jesus with, with such truth and with such passion and no embarrassment. And 129,000 people saw that YouTube clip. Praise God for that, yeah? You may not be on YouTube, but as you walk out to this week, you'll have opportunities to testify. Just ask the Spirit to empower you. So, so he illuminates, he convicts, he empowers, uh, he guides. He guides us into truth. Uh, Billy Graham says that the Spirit takes spiritual truth and makes it understandable to us because the Spirit's work is not just about your salvation. The Spirit's work is actually about your sanctification, the ongoing work of the Spirit in your life is to, to, to grow you and to change you and to, to lead you into truth. That is verse 12. I have much more to say to you, says Jesus, more than you can now bear. Isn't that love? That Jesus knows his disciples well enough and he knows that they're not ready at this point in time to bear that all he could teach them. They were not ready for things they couldn't yet understand. I love that about Jesus. He doesn't dump all truth onto us the moment you're converted. And my youngest child, Micah, is in kindy. Now, I, as a father, do not teach him mathematical calculus or nuclear physics. I teach him basic numbers and, a, and sums and a bit of subtraction. Because that's what he can bear at that age. Verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes after Jesus is gone, the spirit of truth will come and he will guide these disciples. He will lead this, these disciples into all this truth. Not, not all truth about science and world history, but all spiritual truth that they need to grow in their godliness. They'll have those kind of aha moments and say, oh, wow, I now get it. That's the work of the spirit. I love the word guide in verse 13. It means to press home. He will press home truths that you haven't seen before. I did a lot of traveling in my 20s, and I learned a really important lesson. When you, when you head to a new city, the best thing you can do is to buy a guidebook or pay for a guide because you will discover things that you would have never discovered without them. They will reveal things to you you could not find by yourself. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. He reveals things about Jesus that we could never discover by ourselves. He reveals truth 
as we open the scriptures. Because the, the people, the disciples who heard this, they wrote down what they heard. It's called the Bible. It's called the scriptures. This is the sword of the Spirit. And that the primary way that the Spirit guides us today is through his word. It's not the only way. The Spirit can guide us through signs and miracles and prophecies and people. But when you open the scriptures, the sword of the Spirit, you expect him to, to guide you, yes? So here's a few questions, a pastoral moment. Do you open your Bible regularly expecting the Spirit of God to guide you? Do you open your Bible prayerfully asking the Spirit of God to guide you? Do you want the Spirit of God to reveal more and more truths about Jesus? Do you want to grow in your understanding of the glorious riches of Christ? Do you want to see Christ in all his glory? Or are you satisfied with where you're at spiritually? He longs to grow us. He longs to guide us. That's his job. So he illuminates, he convicts, he empowers, he guides, and lastly, he brings lasting joy. He brings this deep-seated joy. Notice I did not say happiness. Happiness is that surface emotion, that fleeting emotion that changes with your circumstance. Joy is this deep-seated emotion that no one can take from you. It's that contentment, that satisfaction, that confidence, that security in Jesus, regardless of how difficult things might be. And that's an extraordinary work of the Spirit in your life. Verse 20, very truly I tell you, that you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. I love this bit of the scriptures where the, the, the disciples are, are basically arguing in Jesus' presence. What, what do you mean by a little while? I, I don't understand a little while. What's he, talk, what's he all about? What does Jesus mean by a little while? That's the question. Just a few hours, just a few hours after Jesus said this, a few hours later, they would watch their Lord and their master and their friend be taken and beaten and mocked and scorned and then crucified. In just a little while, they would not see him because Jesus would be dead. Now, the world was rejoicing at that, verse 20. The world wanted Jesus dead. But the disciples are mourning and grieving. But Jesus promises their grief will turn to joy. And he uses this brilliant example in verse 21 of a woman giving birth to a child. It's a brilliant illustration, although it's kind of a strange audience because he's speaking to men. And says this woman giving birth, there's so much pain and grief. And yet the moment the child is born, she, born, she forgets that because of the joy a child has been born. So it is with you, verse 22. Now is your time of grief but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. It cannot be taken from you. So here's the question. When will we see Jesus again? When will they see Jesus again? It could be the resurrection. When they saw Jesus again three days later. If that's the case, their heart were filled with joy but only for 40 days because they didn't see him anymore. It could be the second coming of Christ. When Jesus comes again, they will see him then. But if that's the case, he's basically saying, it's all doom and gloom now. There's joy in the future. So what does he mean by on that day, your grief will be turned to joy? I think he's talking about Pentecost. When the Spirit of Jesus came. When they got to see Jesus and experience Jesus and to understand things they hadn't understood because God was with them and in them and Jesus was alive in them. And on that day, on that day they rejoiced. And see that promise, verse 22? No one will take away your joy. No one can rob you of your joy. Now church, I hope you know that. It does not matter what happens in life. You might face trials and tragedies, sickness and sufferings, heartache and hardship, but no one and nothing can rob you of your joy in Jesus. Yes? If the Spirit of God is in you, he fills you with an inexpressible and a glorious joy. So no matter what happens in you or around you, you have this contentment and this security and this satisfaction 
That is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. So life's hard. Life's messy. That's what Jesus says in the final verse, verse 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble, you'll have mess, you'll have trials. But take heart. Take heart. Be of courage. I've overcome the world. I don't understand why people even try and do the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. In fact, they can't, can they? The Holy Spirit is the greatest gift. He illuminates Jesus. He convicts. He empowers. He guides. And he fills you with his deep, inexpressible joy. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the gift of your spirit. Let's take a moment to thank our God for the moment in our life when the spirit convicted us and convinced us that we were sinners in need of a saviour. Spirit of God, we need your help to empower us to keep on speaking about Jesus as we go out into our weeks this week. Give us that courage and give us the words to speak about our Savior. And Lord, as we sit under your word, would you guide us into more and more truth? Would you open our eyes to see glorious truths in your word? I want to pray right now for anybody who is lacking joy. Spirit of God, would you fill them? Would you remind them of the joy that they have in the Lord Jesus, the security, the contentment, the satisfaction in him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.